doesn't always look into the science of like persuading people and like having conversations with people. It's really interesting to me. You know, we always try to think we're these kind of logical, rational people, and yet, you know, being right isn't the same thing as being convincing. So it's kind of two different things in my eyes, and, and that's kind of what I explore. Okay, and then what about you, Eric? Oh, no. nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, gosh, it's so cool sitting with friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> this panel's nothing but people burning each other. Uh, so I guess the conversation strategies with atheists need to be worked out first. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Talking Them is a show that I do with uh, Jamie Boone in the fantastic, fabulous hat over there. Woo! And um, we, we started after the atheist experience, but before this gentleman, and um, the reason we started is because people would call into the atheist experience and Matt would pick up and they'd say, I want to talk about the Kalam cosmological argument, and he'll say, I disagree with the premise too, next. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> and then there are people who would call in and they'd be at this crucial moment in their life and they need that advice, and you just, you want to know what happened? And then they hang up and you never find out. And you see it online, people are like, what happened to this person? I no, don't fucking know. <laughs> so we made talk heathen. We wanted to be able to have those conversations slowed down a bit, explained, a little bit more empathy, a little bit more patience. And uh, where somebody says, I want to talk about the Kalam cosmological argument. Take a breath. <laughs> and then we'll say, what's your first premise? And we go from there. And the other thing, the thing that has really, really kind of sparked up from Talk Eden is that atheists call in. And we actually have amazing conversations. And we treat that other piece because it's not just leaving religion, it's giving people a place to land and learning that there are tons and tons of pitfalls 
you know, from parenting to mourning someone who's died. And um, we've got to kind of traverse that together. So maybe if we can talk about it, it will help. We can provide that community. It'll help. So that's, yeah, that's what we do. So Kyle, would you like to talk about dumpster fires? <laughs> that's my show, man. I will, I will let you know when we figure it out first. Okay, good to know. I'd love to learn how to manage them. So that's good for them. Um, no, but we uh, we do a debate discussion platform. Uh, I think actually, literally everyone in this room has been on the show before. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, yes you have. You already, you already put that joke out. Oh, that was service actually. You're stealing from service now. No, I'm serious. You yourself? You and Ocean? He's here too. Oh shit, you're right. <laughs> that's say, that's say, Eric, you started out debating oceans, and so did I. <laughs> it's weird how this it's weird how this works. Uh, but I've always been interested in people who have you know sort of weird beliefs, different beliefs, and getting at why they believe the way they do. And to me, today people have forgotten how to sort of have a conversation with somebody that feels differently than you, believes differently than you, and it's nice to have a place that you can go and have that conversation. Now, does it end in complete dumpster fire at times? Absolutely. But I like to um, sum up non sequitur as this. It is the perfect blend between Jerry Springer and PBS. <laughs> dumpster fires still keep people warm. So. Shannon, would you like to talk about how dumpster fires keep you warm? <laughs> At least we agree there. <laughs> I am so recovering from my co-hosting of Not Sex like two days ago. <laughs> so um, I spend a lot of time co-hosting the Not Sackler show. Uh, I also spend a lot of time on Apologia's show as a, as a cartoon version of me. But I have my own channel, it's called Shannon Q, and the theme of my channel is engaging in complex conversations, advocating for your own understanding, and working towards elevating the discourse. Those are the three things that I like to focus on on my channel. My channel, as I mentioned before, is two-tiered. I, I do scripted research videos that are very well cited, but the part that I'm passionate about the most is actually engaging in conversations with people who have diametrically opposed views to mine, so that we can help model conversations that are about the ideas. And one of the reasons I did that was because when I went, when I entered into this community, I saw a lot of conversations where there were just two people screaming at each other about who is the most right and why the other person was stupid for not being as right as they are. And nothing was being resolved and all it helped to do, in, to my mind, was polarize people further into their existing camps and nobody was really expanding upon or critically analyzing their ideas. And a lot of that was because people didn't that feel listened to or understood so they were never in a position uh, where they were open to to start questioning why they are where they are. So that is what I do on my channel, everybody who's not familiar. All right, thank you very much for that. I mean, we'll get to Modus too, because she was so involved that even before she had one video out, she had she got a thousand, thousand subscribers. subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, when I, when I got a famous form, I had 300. I had less subscribers when I came to the first forum than you did before you made your first video. That feels really weird. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that said, um, so the panel is about conversation strategies with these, which is something that all of us engage in on at least some level. Most of us for, all, for a lot of them. First question would be, and this one I'll go ahead and direct to Dan first since he's given me really weird looks. So do you think there are people or subjects which probably shouldn't be engaged with, and why? That's a great question. I think the first thing I always tell people is, well, are we considering people's personal safety first, right? If there's something, uh, if it's a topic that is going to personally hurt you in some sort of way, for example, um, if you're in danger of being kicked out of your house because you were gay, maybe it's not the best time to talk about that with people, right? Because having a strategy, having a plan for if something like that goes down is probably the first thing you should do first. And even then, people on the internet always say, well, become an adult first and, and make your own income so you have a plan before you have these kinds of conversations. Which, it sucks. It's like, well, I should be able to talk about things whenever you want, and that's true. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who can't do that because they're in danger of some sort of you know, uh, persecution. And that could be from family. That could be from governments. Of course, we don't see that as much in the United States. 
there's a lot of other people in some other countries uh, who definitely feel that, right? So that's the first thing I always say is, are you considering people's personal safety? After that, um, I say just go with your roundhouse, like go go with what's in what you have expertise in to talk in first. If, if there's something that you don't feel comfortable in talking about, it's like, look, I don't have the answers, I don't know. There's so many people who aren't okay with just saying like, okay, I don't know the answer to that. They think that that makes you feel dumb or stupid or like you're not informed. Sometimes it's the honest answer. Yeah, it's not the honest answer either. And it's like, well, I can't be an expert on everything. In fact, that's one of the great things of having a, a show where I bring in guests every week is that they can talk about the smart stuff so they make me look smart by sitting next to them by comparison. <laughs> and, and why in the world did you invite me on? That's what I said. It was a so same week, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are the first things that come to mind when I hear a question like that. Okay, second question, unless it's up, unless anybody else would like to piggyback off of that. Yeah, I'd just like to throw in a little bit, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, what I was, your question specifically was, is every conversation worth having? Uh, no, the question was, do you think there are people or subjects which should not be engaged with? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, uh, anybody who has, uh, has an Uncle Bob that lives out in the woods and is prepping for the end of the world mm -hmm. and really, really has strong opinions about race, it's really not worth having that conversation with Uncle Bob. Probably not. Uh, no. <laughs> um, also, if Uncle, nobody knows about Uncle Bob and you've got 100,000 subscribers, you probably shouldn't put Uncle Bob on your channel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <but> I, <laughs> I don't have 100,000, so it's, can't you talk to me? Well, I, I, mean, I mean, really. And then, then from there, just remember a real basic, basic rule. The rule is respect people. You do not have to respect ideas. If we can follow that, we're generally going to be good. Um, but uh, if the conversation is just about, you know, uh, other people's humanity or autonomy, uh, no, no, I'm not interested in that. I'd rather talk about those ideas. Okay, well that actually leads into the second question, which I was going to aim at you for no reason whatsoever. Um, have you ever had any conversations that you have vehemently regretted? <laughs> All of them. All of them? <laughs> So pretty much every time Darth Dawkins calls in. Ah, uh, okay. That was my answer, but if you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> but, yeah, you, actually, I did have Darth Dawkins call in one time into my show. First, I didn't know who he was. He went by another alias. I actually thought it was Matt Slick at first. They actually have a pretty similar voice. Uh, but uh, I kind of figured it out, and the call went okay. Um, but you know, I'm not, my platform specifically wasn't built for debate. I just can say like, hey, go talk to Matt Dillahunt if you want to go do that. His <laughs> show's on Sundays, man, go, you know. But I, the thing about people like Darth and the people who, who go out and, and attack other people is that they're not really interested in truth, right? They're just interested in getting their script out there to you. And, you know, like, what's the point in talking to people like that? I understand that there is a community of people who like to follow those kinds of people and like to, you know, write down what they're doing so they can kind of make fun of them behind their backs and stuff like that. And, that, and you know, if that's your thing, you go do your thing. But I'm more interested in having the conversations with people who are on the fence about things, who are really considering things. A lot of you know I had a conversation with Anthony Magdamasco quite a few years ago that changed my life in a lot of ways. Um, he didn't make fun of me because I said some things that, looking back, I think are kind of dumb. Um, but I was just a person looking for figuring out my life, looking for truth, uh, and the truth was <laughs> truth wanted. was wanted at the time. <laughs> truth was wanted. And I was engaged as like a human being, and yeah, like my videos was on the internet, and like people, there were mean comments and stuff. You always gonna get that, but like. The fact that we even had that conversation was really magical. And I don't always see that, and even in our community, I think sometimes we're quick to pull our punches and maybe we can just kind of step back a little bit and say, hey, let's just, let's just try to figure something out together as two human beings and not just me as an atheist versus you as a insert whatever thing you're up against this day of the week. You know? um, regrets, we had all. Yeah, all of them. But, but, but it's for probably a reason that you wouldn't necessarily imagine, and that is I go back and watch the shows mm -hmm. a lot, and I'm trying to pick them apart and trying to do it better every time. Pretty much going back and going, I could have done that better, I could have done that better. Yeah, actually the second time Darth Dawkins called, it was almost a year after the first time, and I was fucking ready. <laughs> <laughs> so because of that, you know, but even that, I looked back and went, you know what, I could still do that better. Um, but as far as I wish they had never happened, no. Okay. 
And, uh, this one is for you, Shannon. When you are countering claims, because you do mention you do have your very scripted edited videos, when countering claims, do you prefer to take a logical route or a factual research-based route, or would you prefer to do both, and why? I think that you you definitely need to take a facts-based approach if you're trying to seek out the truth. But if, if, if the question is when I'm countering claims in a video, I take a very facts-based research. Here are my citations, and I always say in every video, please don't take my word for it. Go to the links in the description of my video. See where I got this from, and assess for yourself. Fact check me. I can be wrong. I have my own biases. So in a, on, a, on a scripted video, that, that's what I do consistently. When I'm engaging in a conversation with somebody, I'm more interested in why they think the way they do than I am in debunking uh, what they're saying. I don't engage in debates, really, in, in the fashion that you would anticipate seeing uh, these sort of online debates go in. I will counter what they say, but the way I counter what somebody says is to explain to them why I think differently rather than explain to them why I think they're wrong. Because it will immediately shut somebody down. If you say, well, you're wrong, here's why. That is going to, somebody's going to be like, hey, I'm not wrong. You know, you make them put up the defensive barrier. They'll, the exactly. Thanks, sir. They'll shut down. So what my presentation style, I guess you would say, or communication strategy would be instead to say, okay, so I let me figure out where you got there. Here's how I got somewhere differently. Can you can we both assess our paths together and see where maybe I'm wrong? Let's see where one of us may have gone astray. And I'll start asking some more probing questions to try to delve further into to how they got there so that they'll do more critical analysis of their thought process. So it's, it's not about countering. Like, here, here's the research that shows that you're dumb and I'm smart and I've got the research that says you're an idiot. That, that's not going to, that's not going to convince anybody and anybody who's what, and what, and another really important thing to consider is that when I'm talking to that person, there's a great, especially if there are people in the public sphere, they're invested in, in continuing to think the way they do a lot of the time. So the conversation I'm having with them is not just me showing respect and understanding of them, it's me showing respect and understanding to the people that think like them, that watch them, that follow them, that they influence, that may have come to watch them have a conversation. I want them to have what I say resonate. So that I can, because people don't think about that. When you're, in, when you're in a conversation with the person you're thinking about, the person that you're conversing with, what, in the sphere where we exist, what's really, really important is I'm not just talking to the person I'm existing with, I'm talking to someone I may never, ever hear from, who may never enter a room like this, who may never leave a comment, who may never follow me on Twitter, that's sitting in a room somewhere questioning their ideas, and something I said in a conversation with somebody who was like them made them go, okay, hey, wait a minute. Maybe I should think a little bit differently. And I may never know that happened, but I need to operate in a fashion that Make, I could elicit that. So, that would my answer to the question. Okay. This one is for Kyle. <laughs> I think if I had to preface the question like that, he already knows where it's going. Very ominous. So, which do you think, given your platform, is more beneficial? Formal debates or conversation? And why? Definitely conversations, but I'd like to go back to a question you asked earlier about um, should we, is there anything we shouldn't talk about? I would answer that no. And the reason I say that is because of something that happened actually with, with Shannon. A, probably five streams about yeah. incels, would you say? A uh, very, very dangerous group, very hateful group. Um, if, if you've seen those, it's, it's very, very, very heart wrenching and very dark to go through and watch. And the thing with this group is that they, uh, I got so many messages, and got a lot of messages about how we should not do this. Don't do this, this you know, they don't need to be given a, you know, a platform, don't talk about this. Now the last show that we did, we actually had an incel that left that forum. He is in conversation with Shannon and I uh, weekly He's doing voiceover work and he's changed his entire life because she was willing to have that conversation with him. He's out of that dark place because she was willing to have that conversation. So I think it's important that 
as hard as the conversation is that you have it. Because those are the most important. And you, you could change somebody's life because she did. So bravo for you on that. I think absolutely a discussion because it allows two people to have a conversation back and forth rather than blocked off time grounds. Talking but, past each other usually. Right, and <laughs> you, you don't really get to the heart of the issue. The conversation, you're able to instantly either refute it, rebut it, uh, ask them a question, and you just get a better flow of conversation. Unless it's flatter, and then that just falls <laughs> If it's flatter, I think the best counter is memes at this point. <laughs> So this one, I'm going to go ahead and throw this one at Eric. Uh, do you think there is a bad way to communicate? Is there anything that you would possibly advise against doing? Slow signals. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's tough, man. Um, do I think there's a bad way to communicate? Well, it depends on if you care about what they think about you, I guess. Uh, and on them, it's terrible. Uh, don't make fun of a person and expect them to change their mind. Um, but then again, part of that hominence uh, shook me enough to get pissed off enough to be more critical. So, I don't know. I don't know. That's, my answer. that's a that's a <laughs> answer. I cannot hold you for an honest answer. So, I guess I'll go ahead and throw this one at Kyle again. Are you concerned, and I, I, think, I, I think I know the answer to this because you and I have talked about this before. No, I'm not concerned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Are you concerned that you may or may not be giving harmful ideas more attention than they ought to deserve? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, absolutely that's a concern. Um, it's, it's one that you have to, you have to weigh in, but again, these ideas exist whether you talk about them or not. And yeah. with me, what I think is that the reason that we have such extreme positions is because somewhere along the line we forgot to have that conversation. We forgot to be able to go to someone and, and disagree and walk away. And so what that does is that alienates this group from this group. They fester, they get angrier, they get more radical, and you have the situations that we have today. You can avoid all that if you go to, how many times have we had, like Rand the other night? Rand said that uh, Beyonce was an energy vampire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I might have to take a double take on that one. Yeah, true. But, but he, did a, he did a stream following that, that where he softened his rhetoric uh, that he had going into it. So he left with a sort of, I mean, it wasn't a complete, he still called us demons. But it was a little bit, you know, yeah, it was a little bit Progress. less um, angry. And so, to me, that's worth that conversation because if you don't have it, you just, it just leads to extreme positions. Can I, can I one thing? Okay. Yeah. So, the thing that I want to add to that is that the quickest way to disarm somebody who is, is looking to see you as an enemy is to try is to meet them with an attempt for understanding and not react to them trying to elicit a negative response from you. So when somebody comes at me in conversations, which they do, which you go so many times, my, my line is essentially if you're harming, if you're actively harming somebody else or other people or attempting to harm somebody else or other people and you show no remorse for it, you're doing it on purpose, I, I will elevate the discourse less in that situation because you need to be countered immediately. If you are the victim of horrible ideas, I've been the victim of horrible ideas before, and if I, if I close off these conversations and say to myself, these people aren't worth talking to, then I risk not changing their mind. If I don't try, then they just get to sit there and maybe accumulate more people and exist on counter because their ideas are seen as too dangerous to bother because any attempt at countering them is perceived not as a counter, but as a platform that you're providing for them. So what do you do? What is the appropriate answer? Is the appropriate answer to never, ever, ever address these ideas? Of course not, because if you're not addressing these ideas, then those ideas exist completely unopposed in those people, and they get to pass them on. We need to, we need to put up public opposition. The question is how to do it best, not whether we should do it at all.
You know what I mean? You can sit with the smart people and you make that makes you look good. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you do consider them smarter, Dan, I guess I'll land the next question to you. <laughs> Have you ever had a disagreement with a fellow activist, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, let's go there. Uh, here's a secret. If you sat every single one of the speakers right now at a table and you asked them all kinds of questions, they're going to disagree at some point, whether publicly or not. Like, it's going to happen. So the question is, like, what are we going to do with those disagreements? Are we going to let them affect us enough to where we can't have conversations anymore, where we can't work together on projects, where we can't um, speak together at the same buildings? Or are they negligible enough to where we can work with some of those differences and move on? Because it is, it is unrealistic to come into a movement, especially like ours, and have the expectations that we're all going to agree with and we're all going to have the same opinions on everything at the same time. It's just not going to happen, especially with people like us who are always going to be questioning things. That's kind of our thing. Like it's kind of our, you know, our, our modus operandi, right? I mean, like it's what we do. And and I don't mind having disagreements so much. I think the problem is when you pick one particular pet issue and you make that your one thing and your sticking point and you and you become unreasonable because of this one particular thing. Uh, many many of Twitters have happened and like many people on YouTube and all kinds of things have, have, have the conversations have been sparked because of particular issues and I'm, I'm not even thinking of anybody in particular I just think it just happens in general don't, don't it just happens in general <laughs> I, I'm not the type to go out and attack people on Twitter and and I'm well I'm not as snarky as some people on this table I'll say this much but it's just like I don't know live and let live you got to pick your battles right like I consider that like this is almost workplace conflicts at this point right like I, I see these people all the time and I talk to them all the time you know what do you do when you have a problem with somebody at your work do you talk to them directly do you go straight to HR it's the same kind of thing except we don't have an HR we just kind of this shit out ourselves, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't mind the disagreements. I think if you have them, work it out with somebody, DM them, um, you know, see where you can find common ground, and go from there. And and don't go, don't go straight to the public thing and, and call them out for it because you could be wrong. Like they could still be right about the thing, and and you may have to have another conversation with somebody to figure that out. So yeah, that's my answer to that. All right. We do have one last question, and this one I'll go ahead and address to everyone so we can just get it down the road, starting with Shannon. Very distinct difference. Uh, I think some people perceive an attack on their beliefs as a, as a personal attack because it's so entrenched in the identity that they have. Uh, so when you attack a belief and they see a belief as an intrinsic part of themselves, they do take it personally. The difference is you will elicit thought they will go out and try to research to prove you wrong. They will, they will try to show themselves and show you the reason you're wrong about what they believe, and then at least they're looking. They're doing the legwork. They're actually assessing and engaging in critical analysis. When you attack just a person, you're not eliciting anything other than a reaction from that person towards you that's negative. That, that's, that's all you're doing. You're not getting them to think, unless, unless they get, unless they, rage like Eric did go <laughs> But all, all you're doing is making them feel closed off, further segregating them or entrenching them further in, in, in the idea that you think is bad to begin with. And if you think the idea is bad, ask yourself, and, and, that, and, you, and that elicits from you something that a, a bias against a group of people who have those ideas. You need to take a moment and check your biases because have you ever had a bad idea? Yeah, you probably. Kyle, <laughs> <laughs> right, we started on sex show. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so you have to ask yourself: have, have I ever had a bad idea? Yes, you probably have had a bad idea. Have you ever changed your mind? Yes, you probably have changed your mind. Did you change who you are? Probably not. So people have the ability to change their minds. If you attack them and not the idea, that'll stay with them. Their perception of you will, will completely change and then you lose the ability to have an effect. If you attack the idea, you embolden them to go and find out whether or not it has efficacy. And that's an important distinction that people often forget. Speaking of change, let's talk about our friendship. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. 
know if I can say it any better than um, Shannon just did. What I would do is take out the word um, mock and replace it with attack to make this simple um, point. That if you uh, if you attack a person instead of their beliefs or their ideas, to me that's a reflection on your argument more than anything. If you don't have the ability to take on the person's ideas or their beliefs, and you just have to go to either the person by making fun of them or whatever, it just shows that you don't you yourself don't have a strong case against whatever that belief is. And it's important that you try to stay away from attacking the person because all that's going to do is it's going to entrench them against you. You're, like Shannon said, you're not going to be able to change their mind, and you can't go anywhere from that. So, without drawing out an answer, she said it best as always. So, she's a good job, Shannon. <laughs> Sideways, but 
uh, like the recent incident with Kate Smith, if anybody's from, not from the middle of the hierarchy, I don't understand, but she was essentially deplatformed for the stuff she did back in the 30s. Um, deplatforming, what, what, do you see that as a positive thing, or do you see that as a step backwards? You know, for, you know, whoever it might be. Uh, that's a tough question to answer, because there's certain instances where um, people are actively putting out information that's harming people. Like, you can take Alex Jones, for example. The information that he puts out there, like with Pizza Game, it led to somebody actively going and shooting up a pizza parlor. People like that, that they've pushed information that actively is going to, like, get a pizza parlor shot up. I think that, I can't feel bad for that person when they're deplatformed. Should is a, I mean, should we do deplatforming? It's, I mean, honestly, it's tough to answer that. Um, I don't have a really, I don't have a good answer for you. I think it depends on the, the circumstance. You have to take it by case by case. There's no answer that's going to fit all of it. I think you should work not to. And I think you should work to refute those bad ideas with good ideas. And I think that um, for the most part, people are able to see which ideas are good and which are bad. And I think that if you if you just keep the conversation going and open, you can defeat it that way. I think deplatforming should be a, a last-ditch effort. But yes, in some cases, it absolutely is necessary. Um, this is for Kyle. As a, as a debate moderator, what type of conversations do you think are more important? Conversations against ideas that are very obviously wrong, like say the flat earth, or debates where you have two equally valid opinions and you're trying to figure out which one is more valid? Definitely flat earth. <laughs> Definitely, definitely the two valid positions. Um, I don't think that you can uh, realistically debate flat earth. I think flat earth, that is more so, um, you're being able, you're able to see into the mind of how conspiracy can affect some people. Yeah. How it can take hold and just latch itself and make any basis in reality disappear. It's a look into the, the person's mind more so than that is a debate because you can't debate the shape of the earth. It is a thank you. I always struggle with that word, um, but but definitely when you have two positions that are equally valid and you're trying to get to the bottom of it, not only is that more interesting because it's it's an, a better conversation. You can't ha really have a good conversation with somebody that's saying they can disprove gravity because trees grow up. <laughs> I think Shannon might be the best person to answer this question, but um, uh, when you're having a discussion with somebody and they, they're they throwing out sources and they can't tell the difference between like a credible source and a non-credible source, like, oh, well, what about this study that was done in 2010 that proved that you can see people's aura, you know, like, like weird things like that and they just don't get the difference. How do you handle that kind of... I ask them how they assess the methodology of the study that they're citing to me. That's what I do. I say, when you read that study, what about the methodology did you find the most interesting? Can you tell me how they conducted that study? How did they control for any like, extemporaneous variables in the study? Were there a third variable problem? What type of critical analysis or statistical model did they use to analyze that study? Most people won't answer that question because they didn't read the study. They read an article about that study and it already told us what they wanted to have affirmed. And when I, when, I act, when I go through the, the critical analysis with them of, oh, okay, well, let's look at the methodology together. And if I present something, I'll go through the same favor, favor with you. We'll look at the methodology and we'll see why it's solid. Everybody should look at research methodology because most people read the abstract and the conclusion of a, a study and they're like, nice, perfect. This says what I wanted to say or this says something that I want to think about. If they read the study at all, most, of them, most people will read an article about the study. That forces them into a position where they have to go, okay, maybe I'm not believing something because I thought about it. Maybe I'm believing something because it's what I heard and I wanted to hear it. That's how I do that. Thank you for the question. That was my first question. <laughs> this question is for Kyle and Shannon, mostly. We, we talked about mocking the person versus the, versus the idea, but do you feel there's a point where either the idea is so outlandish or the person that you're talking to is so such a bad actor, bad faith, 
that it's okay to mock them, and Kyle, you probably know who I'm thinking about. <laughs> You're talking about Edgewise? Mandy. Oh. 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 Brett. I wasn't aware we were allowed to curse like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, uh, yes, absolutely. There, um, there was a guy that we had on um, one time that said that there's a fossilized dragon in the um, continent of Africa, all on the backside, and it was necessary because the continents at one time were stacked on top of each other like a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> dragon, dragon undressed now, hamburger. Now you, now you, you, you laugh, but he is completely serious. He has over 600 videos on his channel where he's looking into. He's a flat earther, but he uses. Google Earth, which is a globe. <laughs> um, but he has over 600 videos that are actively looking at these things in detail. They're hours long where he's looking at these things. And he's convinced himself that he's seeing these shapes that aren't there. And this story just materializes with that. But yes, there are people who have such outlandish ideas that, I mean, you shouldn't. I shouldn't, like, laugh and, and just lose my temper and go crazy, but at the time when you have somebody telling you that the continents were a cheeseburger that a dragon took apart and it was a place on the planet, you really can't help it sometimes. The internet is an amazing and terrifying place. <laughs> Agreed. Um, okay, so I kind of want to know what all of you have to say, if that's all right. But how do you remain like calm and not get really mad? Patience is a virtue that I don't really have. But how do you remain like calm when in a discourse with somebody that's like really frustrating? Yeah. I drink a lot of <laughs> so much. It's actually a whole lot easier than you think when, I mean, at, at least we're both in the same studio. And so we're looking at a camera with bright white lights all shining into our eyeballs. And then when we do see past that, we can see a studio audience. And nowhere in that is the actual person we're talking to. And because of that, it does kind of create this separation. And that separation helps us realize, oh, this conversation isn't for me. This conversation isn't for them. This conversation is for the people who are listening. And um, having that line of separation totally helps. I am not that nice of a person in real life. <laughs> indoctrination with arrogance. I think people will say these kinds of talking points and, and we it, it's more offensive to us because we've done the legwork to know why something is BS or why something is wrong when this person who's saying to us hasn't, right? And that's where a lot of that frustration comes, at least in the conversations I have. And when you just come to the understanding like, oh wow, I am in some ways I'm privileged to be in the position that I am because if it wasn't for voices like the people up here and the people who organize this conference, I wouldn't be as outspoken and I wouldn't have done the work and research that I need to get to where I'm at, but also to understand that the person you're talking to probably, probably hasn't talked to somebody who is like you or at least not publicly, right? Like, Obviously, there is a lot of atheists that are out there, but not all of them know a lot about these kinds of arguments, and not all of them are willing to have conversations with people, you know? And you may be the first person that they ever talk to you about something. And I, if, if that's the case with somebody who's having a conversation with me, if anything, I feel honored in that sense, because it's like, wow, I get to be the one to, not to explain why you're wrong, but to explain like, like oh, like, oh, well, here's actually why I might disagree with you, and here's why the people in this community might disagree because of X, Y, and Z. So you take it take it as an opportunity, right? Because uh, having a discourse with someone is, is in general, a good thing, right? Talking about ideas in general is good. So, you know, take that as you will. Drinking wasn't really my answer. <laughs> well, it's like 30% my answer. 30% <laughs> proof? Yeah. Sometimes. Uh, one of the things that I do to keep my patience is I tell myself that I need my, um, my actions to align with my goals. 
and my goal is not to lose my mind at this person in this moment in time. My goal is to get people to critically assess their ideas. And if I want to do that, I can't roll around the internet telling people why I think we're stupid. No matter how, you know, they might be stupid. <laughs> so, sometimes, it, that, that's what I do. I try, I try to, but I also want, I want to make sure that ideas don't fester in the dark. And, and I don't further entrench people. So if my goal is to not further entrench somebody who might be a, a reprehensible person or a person that's really indoctrinated into horrible ideas, the best thing that I can do is be patient with them so that I can maybe help change their mind. Okay, my goal is just to maintain normal blood pressure, so I think <laughs> that's right. Okay, clarifying question. Yeah. So when you're having those conversations, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna take your <laughs> fine. When you're having those conversations, are you in that moment having that conversation to change the mind of the person you're talking to, or are you having that conversation more for the audience watching it? Are you trying to do both? Like what's what's the goal there? <laughs> the, the answer for me is is actually both. It's actually wow. both. Because I, we're, we exist in a platform where we, we engage in conversations one on one with people. Right? Well, everybody here on this panel does, or you know, four two one two, or you know, how, however it operates, either face to face or over the phone. But it's very difficult because you know we're real people who are engaging in these conversations in real time to forget that the actions that we're enacting in that moment aren't just affecting the people that are participating in the conversation; they're affecting the people that are watching that conversation because they, because what we say matters. You have to be cognizant of the fact that what you say on your platforms has an effect, and it might not even be an effect that you see. So you people are watching you. People are watching. And, and it's not even just about changing minds. It's about making sure that people look at how they think about things. Really look at critical analysis. I could be wrong too. I'm not roaming around the internet telling everybody why I'm right. I could be, I'm, I'm roaming around the internet trying to find out if I am. Nice. Did you figure it out yet, Shannon? Do you know? <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, I, <laughs> we do have about just under three minutes left for questions, so if anybody wants to get in their last questions. So, uh, for Shannon, um, you were just talking about um, pointing people away from the abstract in the article about the journal yes. and, and getting them to the actual study. How do you take that a step further? Because this is, this is an experience that I've had a couple times where the like natural news or whole health or some BS thing will actually quote a study and they will come to the exact different conclusion that the study actually showed. Like meditation. Yeah, meditation cures AIDS. No, there was a person in the study who had AIDS and saw health improvement because they were meditating. Right. Um, how do you take those people that are dead set on the natural news article about it? Um, and not only point them to the article, but get them to engage in a discussion about why their reliance on the natural news article is wrong and how to get them to kind of update their way of thinking to be able to go do more research to get a correct understanding. What I would encourage people, not, not everybody's going to do that, not everybody's going to do the legwork. The fact of the matter is that a lot of people, they just kind of glean information based on what they see on social media, based on what they're presented with, and what they're presented with is very likely going to align with the group that they already exist with it, right? So they're going to be presented with affirming information. Most people are pre presented with or seek out affirming information. So what you want to do, or, or what I try to do, I should say. I shouldn't just say that everybody acts like me. <laughs> so, but what, what, you sh what I try to do when I'm in these conversations is, is I try to get people to explain to me how they got to where they are. So what questions did you ask yourself about this? Like, did, did you ask yourself any questions about whether or not they could, they could be wrong? And that question is a question that immediately puts people into the, well, no, usually. Or, or they want to say yes. And that's the truth. They want to say, yes, of course I'm a critical thinker. And now they have to prove that they are a critical thinker in, in real time in that conversation. And if they can't come up with an answer, that elicits the dissonance that's required for them to question more and for other people who are watching to go, hey, wait a minute, 
I read that same article and I came to that same, same conclusion. Did I just believe it because I already believed it? Was I being critical of it? Did I look at the sources? Did I analyze them? Or did I just accept affirming information because that felt good, made me feel like I found a source that tells me what I already believed was true?